Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Davis Vanguard Civ Energy Candidates Forum, co-sponsored by Davis Media Access. And thank you very much to Davis Media Access for doing the video uh, for this evening that will be rebroadcast both on the web and on your cable channel, what, 14? 15. Um, my name is David Greenwald. I am the executive director of the Davis Vanguard, and I will be moderating uh, this forum. I am going to briefly lay out um, how this is all going to um, play out. Uh, so each candidate, uh, starting uh, with Lucas, uh, will have a two-minute introduction, and then we will go down the line um, each, uh, each candidate will, uh, has submitted three questions. They get to pick one of those questions uh, to ask uh, their colleagues. And uh, the, the first person to the left is the person that will answer the question first, and then it goes down the line. And the person who asked the question gets to answer their own question at the end. Um, and then, just to make it more fun, each candidate will have two one-minute challenges and a 30-second challenge. So if uh, somebody says something that you want to dispute or uh, have uh, additional uh, commentary on, you get one minute uh, twice to do that and um, a 30-second quick one. Uh, so keeping the time uh, will be my lovely wife and daughter. Uh, who are sitting in the front, and they have little uh, cards that they will hold up. So when it, uh, you have one minute to go, Cecilia will hold up the one minute, and when it's 30 seconds, she'll hold up the 30 seconds. So please be mindful that we have two hours to do this. I've calculated it out. We're really tight on time, so please stop uh, when your time is up. Uh, if you continue talking, I will start talking over you until you stop talking. Um, so. Not trying to be rude, but in order to get all of this in. Uh, so uh, there will be five uh, questions from the candidates uh, total to each other. And then the Vanguard has two additional questions at the end. Unfortunately, the audience will not get to answer questions, but we wanted to make sure that everybody, or ask questions, wanted to make sure that uh, the candidates had a full two minutes to respond. And with five candidates, you can see how quickly that time adds up. Um, so at this point, uh, without any further ado, uh, we will start with uh, Lucas. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, David. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here today. Uh, my name is Lucas Frerichs. Uh, I'm an incumbent on the Davis City Council, have served for the past four years. Um, thanks to uh, the Vanguard, as well as Civ Energy, and then, of course, Davis Media Access uh, for being here to help tape this and share it with the wider community. Um, so 2016 is a milestone year for Stacy and I. Um, it marks 20 years of us being here in the community. I moved to Davis in 1996 for my senior year of high school, uh, finished up my senior year, and then decided to stay in this community and have uh, been really quite involved for the most part ever since. Um, since 2012, uh, I've been on the city council um, for the past four years now. <clears throat> and we've been a council, I think, that's been pretty focused on getting work done, getting things done in the past four years. Um, there have been quite a few things that have been accomplished, but yet, frankly, there is a lot more to do. Uh, and so that's why I've decided to seek re-election to the city council. Um, in the past four years, I think one of our top goals has been to get the city's fiscal house in order. Um, we governed the city while it shrank its employee workforce by 103 employees uh, or positions. We restructured city employee contracts, cut programs, and adjusted our budgets accordingly. Um, our actions assure, ensured that the city uh, remained financially solvent, but of course there is a lot more work to do in this regard in the next couple of years. We've had some major accomplishments over the past uh, four years. We've approved and built the $225 million surface water project uh, with Woodland and UC Davis, uh, which will be complete by this summer. Um, $90 million total upgrade of the uh, city's 45-year-old wastewater treatment plant. We're investing millions of dollars into the roads infrastructure that is sorely needed and we have a lot more to do. Uh, and then we've also been working on fostering high quality economic development, particularly with regard to the DMG Mori factory, uh, as well as the Davis Roots Incubator. Um, this, serving on the city council is a big job. I really enjoy it. I've been hard at work, I think, over these past four years and want to continue that work in the years ahead. 
Um, I think we need to continue our investments in infrastructure, of course, roads, bike paths, et cetera, and then also, you're welcome, thanks. Appreciate your support. Brett? Hi, I'm uh, Brett Lee. I'm um, currently on the city council with uh, Lucas. And um, I think I would echo some of the things that Lucas just uh, said. I, I think we've accomplished some uh, pretty significant things so far, but we definitely have a ways to go. Um, I currently work as a project engineer in my daytime job, and it feels as if we're just sort of in the middle of a project. I mean, the current council has started some things and we definitely would like to see them through. So we're working on a renter's ordinance, we're working on a variety of other things. Um, one of the things that I've noticed when I talk to people, and it actually shouldn't be surprising because, uh, you know, why would you uh, follow the city council like following like baseball players or something? But a lot of people don't really know my background because I haven't been involved in city politics that much until relatively recently. My grandparents moved to Davis in the 1940s and my mom went to Davis High, and she was a UC Davis grad. And so I have a long connection with the community. And when I was a kid, um, the boundaries of Davis on the north were Covell, and on the right, uh, on the east, uh, Pole Line, and on the west, 113. And I've watched sort of over time as the boundaries have expanded, and there have been some good things about that, and there have been some not so good things about that. And I think that's one of the things I bring to the council, that you know, from the 1960s forward, watching how our town has changed. And I think it's important to understand that we can't put the city in sort of a, a ball of amber and just keep everything the same, because we are sort of in an evolving area in terms of population, in terms of changes in technology and changes at the university. Um, but I think we can go about growth or change in a smart, respectful way that keeps the important things of our community intact. We've seen some, pro and I'll probably elaborate this on a little bit later when I have a little more time, perhaps, but we've seen some developments that I think have really gone in the opposite direction that haven't sort of kept uh, thank the you. quality of life in Davis. Well, uh, thank you, David. Thank you to the Vanguard uh, and uh, Civ Energy for putting this on. Of course, thank you to DMA for all the work that you do, uh, including today. Uh, my name is Will Arnold. Uh, I am uh, a Davis resident since birth. was born in uh, at Woodland Memorial Hospital and came home to a house on Marina Circle. Uh, have, uh, have been involved in the community since I was a kid uh, at Davis High School. Went to North Davis where my seven-year-old now goes. Uh, then Emerson Junior High and the high school. I was student body president of those latter two uh, fine institutions, and I do see some fellow Blue Devils here in the audience, uh, as well as teachers, Mr. Livingston, um, and, uh, and have been recently very involved uh, in uh, local, um, both politics as well as, as governance. Uh, my day job, I work for our state senator, Lois Wolk, in her district office, uh, which is very different from the work that uh, most people think of when you work for the legislature. Uh, my office is in Vacaville, not at the Capitol, and most of my work is constituent services. Folks calling up our office, uh, typically because they've tried and tried to get their issue uh, resolved to no avail, and we're their last best hope to try and uh, to try to help them out. And uh, I've been doing things like that my entire life: constituent service, community service, and I see. Um, this opportunity to serve on the city council as, as a step uh, towards serving the community uh, in an even uh, better fashion. I love this town. We're multi-generational uh, in, in this town. My family moved here in the 50s to open a Pontiac dealership. Uh, my dad uh, was a Blue Devil uh, business owner in town. Uh, my mom taught in the district, school district, for 40 years. Uh, so uh, I'm just hoping to live up to their uh, legacy of service to our community. Thanks, Paul. Oh. Uh, first of all, before I begin, uh, I'd like to confess that I'm afraid. Uh, I am, I'm afraid I may have overdressed. 
Uh, well, that's okay. It just shows that I'm new to the process. I tried to take off the coat. I did the tie a little bit. I looked relaxed. I looked capable. Um, I'm not going to give you a lot of background right now because if you want to find out anything about me, all you have to do is put my name into the internet and you will find thousands and thousands of hits. I'd like to warn you in advance, though, that most of what you read on the internet is a lie. Okay? Take it with a grain of truth, but you can find out everything you want to know. You can go to the Civ Energy website and you can find my entire profile that even shows you a picture of the building where I was born and raised in Chicago. So you can find out everything you want to know about me. But in the few minutes we've got right now before we begin, I want you to know I'm an attorney, I represent government agencies, I represent people that want documents and information from government agencies, so I'm all about information. The freedom of information, because if you don't have information, you can't make a decision. You have to decide amongst us here who's most capable of getting the business of Davis done. Now incumbents say they can do it, of course, I believe I come with certain skills that even add to what the incumbents might have. Okay, Matt. Who is Matt? I'm passionate about both Davis's present and its future. My campaign is not about political office. As a retiree, I can devote my undivided attention to the most pressing issues our community faces. I will be a full-time public servant in support of the citizens and residents of Davis. I have been and will continue to be an independent voice for all Davis citizens. My volunteer service and experience is both rich and deep. I have served the community in finance and budget, water, senior citizens, the Davis Arts Center, the Health Council, and the General Plan Advisory Committee for Yolo County. People describe me as independent and a listener, open-minded, inclusive, and fair, analytical, thorough, diligent, and knowledgeable. I will not kick the can down the road. I will roll up my sleeves and will work full time collaborating with my fellow council members and citizens to preserve the high quality of life that Davis treasures. I look forward to earning your vote and serving you well. Thank you, Matt. Okay, so um, we will begin our round of uh, questions and Lucas will ask the first question and Brett will answer it and then it, it'll go down the line. So, Lucas? What questions are the questions that uh, you submitted? Apologies for that. We. I guess the uh, format of the uh, of the uh, debate was not necessarily fully uh, <laughs> communicated to us. Okay, let's see. And um, at least I didn't understand the the, the direction. So, so I'm not supposed to ask my first question. Uh, yeah, uh, pick whichever one you want to ask. Uh, you only you're only going to have time to ask one question. So just so the audience understands, so it doesn't sort of. We were asked to submit three questions to David uh, earlier in the week, and so I, I can understand why there might be some confusion as opposed to, we were asked to submit them to David, so if we were asked to submit them to David, then why are we having to come up with them now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry about that, sorry. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, the first question then that I would ask to, uh, is, based on the information you have today at today. Let's see. Based on the information you have on hand today, do you support or oppose the Mace Ranch Innovation Center proposal? And what justification would you would you make to would you use to make this decision? <laughs> and how much time do we have? Please? Two minutes. <laughs> so, so based on the information I have today, I would be voting no on the Mace uh, Innovation Center. Um, I can say that I felt the similar way about the Nishi proposal up until probably about two weeks or so before the council was going to vote on the proposal, and that was because the developer did something which um, surprised me. 
Basically, he committed to not having anyone occupy the Nishi site until the Caltrans Richards Interchange project was complete, and also the university had completed the alternate, the secondary access point to the Nishi parcel. Uh, so that's locked into the Measure JR language. So that changed my thinking because I was very concerned about the Richards, all of the uh, traffic impacts. As far as MACE, as, a, as it stands now, it's sort of this generalized 200 acre proposal which is a little bit murky, the details are not there. The estimate of the revenue to the city is about $2 million a year which is rather small when you compare the fact that uh, a two acre hotel can generate about $500,000 of revenue to the city per year. So we're talking about two acres versus 200 acres. We're talking about uh, a proposal that has a 10 to 20 year build out. And if you think about 10 to 20 years, that's a very long time frame. And the thing about this proposal is there are a lot of variables and there's a lot of uncertainty. So at this point, until I see some uh, details nailed down, I have very serious concerns about the traffic impacts and actually whether it's really a high tech business park or whether it's just a plain old industrial park. So if the vote were today, I would be voting no, but uh, we still have yet to see a very specific proposal before us. Thank you. Will. So Brett alluded to it. Uh, there's still a lot of information uh, that we're going to gain about this proposal. So we don't have complete information now, but, uh, but Lucas was um, uh, mindful of that when he asked the question, which is based on the information that you have now, would you support it? And uh, I would have to say that I'm very uh, intrigued, borderline excited about this proposal. Uh, we need to diversify our, uh, our economic ecosystem. Uh, if, our, if an ecosystem lacks diversity, it fails to thrive. And right now, our uh, revenue uh, ecosystem is completely not diverse where it comes from town. And that's not necessarily a good thing if you ask folks in Detroit or West Virginia how having one single entity uh, essentially control the economy of your, of your area, your town, how that works out for you. So, uh, you know, we have, I think, um, certainly there's still a lot to learn, but the, there's a potential here for uh, 10 million in, in one time revenue to the city and up to 6 million per year for the city in revenue, and this is the type of revenue we're not getting right now, and this is allowing us not to have to go back to the taxpayers every time uh, we need something uh, for our community. And if, in my opinion, uh, this doesn't pass, uh, we're gonna have to turn around to our community and ask for a parcel tax with three zeros at the end of it. So that's part of the choice we have to make when we're looking at uh, whether to support this project. Thank you. Paul. I have to begin by saying that I can't answer this question. Let me explain why. Any public official has to answer four questions when making a decision at all that affects the public benefit or spends the public money. The first is, are you involved? Are you affected by it? If the answer is yes, they have to accuse themselves. It's a conflict of interest. I define conflict of interest very broadly. If anyone gives me money on something like that, I believe there's a conflict and I would have to excuse myself. I'm not sure at this point. I have taken no donations, I have solicited none or endorsements, I'm not going to. Secondly, who's going to help? Who is the proposal going to help? Third, who's going to hurt? And last, how much does it cost? And frankly, right now, I agree with Fred, we don't know enough. There simply isn't enough in the process right now. And all in all fairness, I can't tell you. But more importantly, as a public official, you learn more. And that's what I'm hoping to be able to do. Thanks. Matt? Most of today's problems are yesterday's solutions. If we made a decision about Base Ranch Innovation Center, but for the reasons that Brett and Paul have said, we would be potentially solving something immediately, but creating problems down the road. We do not know enough. I'm a member of the Finance and Budget Commission. The Finance and Budget Commission has received no information about number four of Paul's cost. We don't know. We can project, we can talk about it in prose, but there need to be hard numbers in order to make a judgment. In the absence of 
full information, you can't, I can't say yes. So to answer Lucas's question, I would say no, I would vote against Mace Ranch Innovation Center. I believe the community is served by repeatable, reliable, open, transparent processes, and we need to continue the Mace Ranch consideration with those kinds of processes. The Open Space and Habitat Commission said that they absolutely oppose Mace Ranch. That's part of our community. It was an open and transparent process. We need the rest of the community to weigh in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now Lucas, you answer your own question. Sure. So uh, to answer the question that I posed to everyone else um, regarding the Mace Ranch Innovation Center proposal, I, I think there's some, at least been some similar uh, types of comments with regard to the need for revenue diversification in the city, right? Um, we have consistently gone to the well uh, with uh, the citizens regarding uh, additional, you know, parcel tax after parcel tax for various um, needs, and I think that that is something that uh, we can't just rely upon the citizens of Davis to continue to just automatically support. Um, so, the, trying to diversify our revenue from economic development is one one way to get there. Um, I think the, and we need to be pursuing that, and we've been pursuing it. We, I think, at least several of us believe in terms of Nishi, and then also from some of the other types of um, economic development with. Mori Seiki and, and Davis Roots and others that we're working on. Um, I have some serious sustain issues of concern regarding sustainability features of that proposal currently. Um, you know, right now the proposal is for 8,000 parking spaces. Um, that's a lot. Uh, you know, I mean, I think, and, and the build out, of course, is not for up, up to 30 years, but some significant issues I think would be associated with it there. There's also this proposed two to one ag mitigation, of course, which is a city feature. and the, the developer is pro currently proposing to buy the Howitt Ranch property that the 800 acres that the city already owns to the east of the Mace Ranch Innovation Center site. Why would we be buying something we already own <laughs> and, and, you know, when it's already ag mitigation land currently? Um, I certainly very much value the commission's input uh, all across all the commissions and I, there's still additional work to be done. But at this point, um, I... Uh, well, I think there's a lot of work to be done and could, could get there uh, to be supportive. I think there's still, f for me, far more questions that remain about the viability of the Mace Ranch Innovation Center um, proposal. So um, at this point, I'm not, uh, would not be supportive at the moment. Thank you. And so, I so did want to apologize to the candidates. I can see that my uh, instructions that I sent out weren't as clear as they were in my mind. So. Uh, Apologize for the awkward moment there. Hey, David, how do I take advantage of my opportunity to do a rebuttal or whatever? Um, you can um, go ahead and do, uh, I just do your one minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I do want to, uh, I'll, do, I'll do a minute, why not? I'll okay. save the 30 second one in case I have a one word. Uh, uh, so I just want to clarify that, that there's a lot of work to be done about this or any potential project. And so the question in my mind was based on the information now, well, no, we have, comp we have incomplete information and I don't wanna make a decision based on incomplete information. So anything that's before we go through this public process, I would say I wouldn't support it. But that wasn't how the question was in my mind. The question was, you know, once we get to a point where we have the complete information based on what you expect that information will be, I suppose, where are you on this issue? So I just wanted to clarify that, that no, we haven't gone through the full process and that needs to happen. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, we got another one. Paul, uh, 30 seconds. Go ahead. I am skeptical of the justification that we need the money. If we need the money, and we have to develop because of it. You have to ask yourself, why do we need the money? We have a lot of money. There's a lot of taxes going into our, 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 our coffers. Where are they being spent? If we need the money so badly that it justifies development like this, we have to think about our practices and what we're doing. Okay, thank you. And uh, just to let you guys know, it's hard for me to see down the lines. So if uh, you want to pipe up, uh, just uh, audibly say it. Matt, did you want to go? Or, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so second question, uh, Brett asks, and now Will is the first to answer. 
So there have been a fair number of uh, proposals for large apartment developments in our town recently. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts specifically on the trackside proposal and the Sterling development proposal. And for those of you uh, not following trackside proposals, the proposal near the railroad tracks on 3rd Street, uh, across the street from uh, the SPCA. And uh, Sterling is the proposal adjacent to the post office at the old Families First site. Maybe I learned my lesson from the last question that, look, we don't have enough information about these things, <laughs> right? In fact, the, the uh, track side one, they're going back to the drawing board. That's my understanding that this uh, um, Thursday or next Thursday, they're, they're doing a community meeting that they're going to have all kinds of different options out on the table. And so we don't know anything about what that's going to look like. Um, I think we know a little bit more about what's being proposed uh, down on uh, down on Russell at the at the old family's first spot, um, and there's some real concerns from neighbors that, uh, that that I've heard and traffic concerns and all the and all the things that uh, that happen with these big developments. So there's there's a lot of uh, information that's yet to come out about both of these proposals, especially uh, the new iteration of Trackside before any of us can make a decision. That said, uh, we do have a, a real, um, I really don't like using the word crisis. It's not, I don't like using the word crisis and I don't like using the word renaissance. <laughs> uh, and so we have a real, uh, we have a real uh, um, issue here with rental housing. Uh, our vacancy rate is essentially zero. And that has a lot of negative consequences, both for the renters themselves, as well as for the neighbors of uh, mini dorms that pop up in our neighborhoods. Uh, so it's a problem. And, and saying that the university's not doing enough, while that's true, they're not even living up to their own obligations, that doesn't help our citizens who are trying to rent, who want affordable rent. So it's an open question. What are we going to do about it? And if we say we can't, we're not, we're not going to build any of it, then that just kicks the can down the road. Thank you. I don't know that much about Trackside, to be honest with you. I know more about the Sterling Fifth Street development, and there's parts and aspects about it that are troubling to me. When I went to law school 30 years ago here in Davis, uh, a lot of my classmates lived in Rancho Yolo. Uh, that's the only place they could afford, and frankly, it's one of the best places in Davis to go to if you're a student, etc., that kind of thing. I'm very concerned about the Fifth Street development because I am worried about the ultimate impact on Rancho Yolo. I'm worried that ultimately there may be an opportunity or a desire to get rid of it and build new housing there. I can understand it because that might be considered a better use of the property, but I don't see it that way. I would also be very concerned about traffic impacts that I haven't been satisfied on. I use Fifth Street every day, and it's busy, and it's dangerous for bicyclists. What's going to happen if you put a whole bunch of apartments there? But lastly and most importantly is the word affordability. Even as somebody who didn't pay attention a lot to politics and was just fat and happy in Davis, I did notice that oftentimes they'd say they'd be affordable, and suddenly we find out it's $2,000 a month and nobody but, but wealthy foreign students can afford to stay there. That doesn't sit well, well with me. I like foreign students very much, but if you're going to say they're going to be affordable, make them affordable. Both Trackside and Sterling Fifth Street suffer from the same problem. And it's actually a problem of our own making here in Davis. We are doing all of our planning by general plan exception. <coughs> Both of the projects are, have proposed outside the boundaries of the general plan. Raise your hand if you knew that they were asking for a zoning exception. That's half of the room, not bad. But the reality is, is that I don't think you can find anywhere out in writing declared to the, to the citizens that we are looking, they are looking to work outside the general plan. Trackside is pretty simple. The, in 2005, the zoning was changed to mixed use. It has very specific three stories with the possibility of four and no more than 2.0 floor area ratio, which means that you can only have as much space in the building as is on the land 
times two. They've proposed six stories and uh, almost a four far. It's outside the boundaries. So as it's proposed, you say no. We need to have repeatable, uh, reliable, open and transparent processes and hopefully Thursday we'll, be, we'll get that to that point. The same thing is true with Sterling. They are proposing something that is outside the zoning. It needs to be open, transparent. I believe that the mitigated negative declaration is just as much of a mistake in this case as it was with the Hotel Conference Center. We need to commit ourselves to processes that we can all rely on, expect, set expectations, deliver on the expectations, provide value. Thank you. Back to Lucas. Uh, so let's see. Firstly, um, I s I'm very supportive of infill development in Davis. Uh, many of you have been to my home on B Street, just a few blocks from here, which is, uh, I think, I'm personally proud of uh, as a good example of uh, infill development. And if any of you are interested in coming who have not been to my house or our Shepherd's Close uh, infill development, please come on over. I'd love to show you around. Um, so for Trackside uh, specifically, so Stacy and I were, had previously been investors in the Trackside proposal. Um, we had invested $50,000 into it, not that much per se, but uh, we're two individuals with no children and so we were interested in, in building a, you know, we felt it would be a good infill project. Um, but we recently, along with several of other investors, the original investor pool, including um, actually Reverend Bill Habicht, who's pastor here, uh, and his wife, we all, I, we took our shares, we withdrew our shares from the trackside proposal. Um, I think that, and there's a variety of reasons for that certainly, in, and particularly because I am not allowed to, if I were an investor in that property and it was redeveloped or developed, it would basically um, limit me from being involved in decision making with and in other parts surrounding the, in the downtown area. Uh, I think infill can be done right. Uh, but it, it, it really has to be done very well. Uh, it's, it's all about, for me, design appropriate and appropriate density for the neighborhoods. Um, I think there is also, uh, and if that's, so that's true for whether it's for Trackside or also for the Sterling project. I think both of the proposals, uh, as was mentioned, Trackside sort of seems to be going back to the drawing board. Uh, Sterling is not ready for prime time at this point. Uh, there are multiple iterations yet for both before they would be ready for approval. Uh, including multiple processes of commissions up through the Planning Commission through the City Council. And then the last thing I would say is that I think it is actually, especially having been an, on the City's General Plan Housing Element Steering Committee, it's time for a general plan update, wholesale. Thank you. Okay, Brett, you get to answer your own question. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll be, be brief. Uh, two minutes is, goes by a little quicker than I had imagined. So with Sterling, I've met with the neighbors there. I, I think the size and scale is inappropriate for that parcel. It's a privately owned parcel. Something is going to happen there. Um, what I've told the people, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I, t I don't pander to people. So they want me to, they want to hear that nothing will be built there. I'm supportive of apartments being built there, but definitely not the size and scale as proposed. It's, it's far, far out of proportion. My, my guidance is what the zoning is. Right now it's zoned for uh, medical office types of uses. And so given the basic level of zoning, I'd like to see what the traffic impact would be if it were built as zoned. And then from that, I would get a general sense of how big an apartment uh, complex would sort of match that level of impact. So that would be my guidance. Uh, from what I've looked at, it's completely inappropriate in terms of size and scale. As far as track side, Again, it goes back to uh, the zoning. I think Trackside, as proposed, is much too tall. It's zoned for three stories. The developers purchased the land quite recently, so this is not a, a new surprise to them in terms of what the zoning is. You can understand if somebody owned a parcel and they've had it you know, for 50 years and they so decide to invest and you know, oh my gosh, who knew that the zoning was this? But this was purchased in the past couple of years, and so um, I think they need to respect the zoning. And if they do wish to have a variance to the zoning, there has to be some overriding community benefit. But as proposed, uh, let me back up a little bit. The city council has the ability to change the zoning essentially everywhere. 
So imagine if you lived in your home. Many of you have lived in one-story homes or two-story homes. Imagine if we changed the zoning of the parcel next to your home to six stories. That's not, it's not a pleasant thought. So the people here are not NIMBYs. They're not being unreasonable. I mean, we're actually, you know, what's being asked is okay, to thank you, essentially destroy their neighborhood. Okay. Uh, Lucas uh, has requested a 30-second. Go ahead. The, I just wanted to add a little bit in on regarding the Sterling uh, apartment proposal. You know, one of the things, so I, I similarly feel that there will probably be some sort of uh, change in that, in that site, right? It's really sad that EMQ, you know, ran families first into the ground. Uh, and then now we have this beautiful campus there. And it is, you know, we've tried, we've worked on talking with the community or the county, excuse me, and a bunch of the different nonprofits to see if there could be some sort of social services type campus there. Um, it's not, there's not a lot of money out there for to actually put that together. We've been working diligently on that effort. Uh, but I think the other thing I would add uh, is that- Oh, oh you're thir the 30 yeah. seconds up, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I forgot too. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Okay. Um, Will, you are asking. Okay, which one did you? So, we spend a lot of time talking about our community's challenges, but what assets and opportunities does our community have which we are not yet leveraging to our full potential? Well, I can answer that very quickly. Um, does anyone here know what the maker space is? Okay. Um, that's great because I expected far fewer hands. The reason why I expected far fewer hands is because most people in Davis don't know it's there. The makers are people who are inventors. They're people who are engineers who want to share their experience with the community, with children, with schools. They exist in many communities around the world. And we have one here right in Davis that's very fine. It's tucked away in an alley. And it's a resource we could use and we need to actually encourage it. If we can build huge, what are essentially gated communities in Davis, then we can put a little bit of resource behind something that is so beneficial that if it just sparks one child's imagination, then it's worthwhile. If we can get just one kid who might be out there and see something they think is cool and it makes them want to invent, we've done our job as a city, as a society, as a community. Okay, Matt. Davis is more than decisions about pieces of real estate. It's more than decisions about real estate opportunity. When you look to leverage existing strengths and characteristics and core competencies, there needs to be a balance. We need to look at the social as well as the economic. We look at, need in the, look at the environmental impacts of that leveraging process and come up with a solution that is balanced for the community. Um, we also need to think to the future. We need to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of our future generations to meet their own needs. So I really think that the process that got started in 2011 where we had the um, Innovation Task Force predecessor and then on through has wrestled with not the nuts and bolts and bricks and mortar of the community, but has tried to think about those core assets. When you start and actually end with what is the core competency of Davis as a community, it starts with the university. So forging a much stronger, better, more interactive win-win partnership with the university is the one asset that I don't think we're leveraging enough. Okay, back to Lucas. Yeah, I actually agree with uh, Matt in regards to the university uh, sort of asset that we are not leveraging to the extent that we could be. I think though, it's for me, it's um, more a little bit more specific than that, and it deals with issues of transportation. Um, I think, so one of the things that I've, some of the things I've been involved with since I've been on the city council, some of these intergovernmental bodies that I serve on are YOLO bus and uh, the Capitol Corridor um, and SACOG and such. 
Um, and all of those deal with transportation. And I think that we, we have some of the most amazing assets here, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the university. So one of the, uh, in the Institute for Transportation Studies is doing nationally renowned uh, changing sort of um, research and uh, on, on how to change mode shares, how to look at transportation systems in a whole new way. And I really feel that aside from those issues, uh, I think the real aspect, the other part of transportation dynamic that I feel like we really need to truly, frankly, double down or triple down on in this community is biking. <laughs> and it's not, and, and it goes, but it also goes into the parking issues as well. I think we need to have a real comprehensive conversation about our transportation system in this community and how to get people to be using Unitrans more and, and how to make sure that the schedules are effective so people are actually u wanting to use Unitrans more and things of that nature. Unitrans is looking right now at going fareless, free, free bus rides, not pay anything at all. Uh, and so those are the types of things that I think that we really need to spend time on uh, very, uh, you know, it's a very holistic way, taking into account all the different transportation sectors. But, you know, if we are going to meet the, some of the major challenges of not only this community, uh, but also, frankly, you know, nationally and globally in the next, uh, within this century, we have to really reimagine our transportation system. So. Um, I think that that's something that we should be uh, really focusing our efforts on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brett? Can I, can I have the question repeated? Uh, that, does that eat into my time? Or? Uh, yeah, I can repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, it comes out of your time. It comes out of everyone's time. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, then that's okay. I'll, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so I said uh, we talk a lot about the challenges that we have as a community, but what assets and opportunities uh, do you believe our community has that we aren't... Uh, leveraging or utilizing to their full potential. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, so thanks for the indulgence there. So uh, I apologize if you've heard this story before, but I, I think it's relevant. Um, so I'm a member of the Rotary Club, and uh, typically in Davis, you know, we have people come in and tell us about all these amazing projects they're doing overseas, digging a well in uh, Thailand somewhere for some village, or reading glasses for uh, senior citizens in Africa. I uh, had the good fortune to go to a Rotary Club meeting in Oakland, and they were talking about their own community, and then they were talking about uh, gangs, they were talking about uh, you know teen pregnancy, drug use, all these sorts of things. And it was uh, you know as I was driving home, I was thinking, man, they've got a lot of challenges. And I'm kind of a big fan of Jerry Brown, and uh, you know he was mayor there for a while, and he struggled. And they've been really working hard on trying to address their issues. But these are multi-generational sort of problems and multi-generational solutions. In comparison, Davis's problems are very straightforward. I won't say they're necessarily easy, but they're straightforward. We talk about this need for economic development. Basically, we're in our city budget, we're about four to five million dollars short of taking care of our infrastructure needs. That's a $75 parcel tax. You everybody pay an extra $75? Problem solved. Now, I'm not saying that's what the answer is, but it tells you like one possible solution. That's pretty straightforward. So you add in a hotel, you add in some other smaller sort of development. Maybe that parcel tax is $40. Maybe we're a little more uh, cost conscious when we uh, deal with uh, you know, spending ideas. But Davis's problems are really strictly straightforward because we have had the good fortune of people investing in our community in the bike paths and having relatively uh, safe community, various you know good schools, things of that nature. Our problems are not dramatic and uh, incomprehensible or unsolvable. They are straightforward, uh, but you got to have practical sort of uh, you know reasonable people to uh, address them. Thank you. Okay, we'll answer your Thank own you. question. So when I announced my candidacy. Um, I gave a speech, and there was a metaphor in the speech that was just reach out your hand. And if you want to know what the metaphor is about, I suggest you look it up. It was on the Vanguard a few weeks ago. But the point was that Davis, and I'll paraphrase the speech, Davis is a great place and people want to be here. They want to study here, they want to work here, they want to invest here, they want to walk here, run here, bike here, occasionally drive and park here. They want to plant roots, raise a family, and be part of a community here, and that's a very good thing. And we typically talk about people as being a problem for our community. They cause traffic, they cause noise, pollution, uh, litter, 
all kinds of things. But people are our community, and they're our community's greatest asset. And when we talk about things coming up like we have such a low vacancy rate, that causes problems. Those are challenges. But it's because people want to learn at this university, people want to live in town. We talk about the Mace Ranch Innovation Center. We talk about it as potential challenges for our community. But the only reason it's being discussed is because a local guy named Tyler Schilling, a Blue Devil, uh, wants to expand his uh, technology uh, firm. And he can't do it in town, so we're trying to find a spot for him to do it. People want to invest in this community, and I think that gets lost in the conversation. And it, if, if nothing else comes from my candidacy, it's to create uh, aspirational awareness that, uh, that with our challenges also come opportunities. Okay, thank you. Um, any uh, challenges? Yeah, Matt? I'd like to use a minute. Okay. When we look at the general plan and the fact that we're doing planning by exception, the thing that causes us to do that is that the general plan says we have 64,000 people as our maximum population. We all passed that a long time ago. But, but it points out the fact that impacts to our quality of life are not by person. Compare Rob Davis and me. Rob Davis's footprint on the planet is so much lighter. The impacts on the community are so much lighter from Rob than they are from me. What we need to be thinking of is how to incent better decisions. Sterling would be a much better, uh, much lighter st uh, footprint on the planet if they had 0% automobile share and 100% bike share. Same thing would be true of Nishi. If we made vehicle miles traveled the reward as the top in our general plan for how big we can get, then as we work smarter, we work harder, we work more efficiently, we leverage the resources that we have, we could actually have a better community without the quality of life being reduced. Thank you. Yeah, Paul. No idea how much time I've got. Uh, um, you got either a, a minute or, uh, well, you have one minute uh, for a I'll challenge. Use as little of it as I can. Uh, some things that you've been hearing over and over again while we've been sitting here is that we need new revenue. We talk about a parcel tax. But a couple words you've also heard are important is that a lot of people want to live in Davis. Davis is a destination. People want to come here. They want to have a good time. They want to live here in Davis. That gives us another word you heard earlier. I wrote it down. Leverage. We have leverage. Lots of it here. I'm a negotiator. My job is to get the best value for my clients. And I sense here we've got a lot of leverage we're not using, a lot of value we're not using when it comes to development deals, when it comes to our arrangements with our uh, public employees. There's a lot of value we have. We're under negotiating against, we're negotiating against our strength. We should realize that people want to come here, and there's value in that. Okay. Any others? Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, Paul, you ask. Um, this is the issue that brought me to here, here today. This is the issue that convinced me to throw my hat in the ring and get off of my couch and stop watching cartoons. My question for this panel here is, is that, are you in favor of or against a soda tax? And if so, why? Okay, Matt. That wasn't the question I expected him to ask. It didn't have enough flame to it. Um, well, I can ask another one. <laughs> okay. I'm of two minds with regard to the, the soda tax. One of the reasons that I, I can be absolutely 100% for it is that it is a 100% avoidable tax. So you put the soda tax on, people can modify their behavior, and they don't have to pay the tax. And in the process, they become healthier, wealthier, maybe wiser. 
you know, it, it makes an immense amount of sense. My problem with the soda tax is, is that it, it sprung like Athena, fully armed from the head of Zeus. Um, it, it, the, Matt, into the mic, please. It hasn't, it, it, it hasn't had the community dialogue so that we can build consensus around it. I think that the public health issues, as I said, I was on the Yolo County Health Council. I worked for 30 years in healthcare. There is no question that sugary beverages are deleterious to our health. Um, I think that it would be nice if we could voluntarily modify our behavior to, to not consume these things that are bad for us, but we're human beings. So a tax that's fully avoidable, that makes our health better, um, makes our community better, is one that I think can be done. And the complaints that I have heard that it's going to be difficult to administer. Computers solve most of that, and the only problem is that so you get handed a cup and you walk over to a machine, and they have no idea whether or not you're pushing a sugar uh, drink or a non-sugar drink. That's a solvable problem. OK, just a reminder, everybody should be about two to four inches away from the mic in order for um, the, it to pick up. OK, uh, Lucas. Uh, so a few weeks ago, the city council was faced with this exact uh, conversation, uh, and I voted to not put a uh, sugary beverage uh, tax on the ballot for the June uh, 2016 election. Uh, the reasoning at the time is the same as the reasoning today, which is that I feel like uh, we did not, there was not really any kind of real community discussion over this issue. Um, I think that there needs to be one, uh, I mean, on a much more uh, broad-based scale than what uh, I appreciate very much the public health advocates that came uh, to the city council um, uh, in uh, in early December and then uh, and then nothing. But then again, as I mentioned in the, at the council meeting in our deliberations on this, we then had a goal setting session. The city council, the current city council, had a goal setting session in mid December to sort of check in on all of our city council goals, and it was never raised. It was never brought up as an issue. Uh, one as a top priority by any of the council members at the time, so um, I was not uh, willing to vote uh, to put it on the ballot. Um, I do think that there are, are merit to these sort of sin taxes, um, but I also at this point felt like, you know, we had more pressing more pressing issues uh, as the council to be dealing with uh, than um, than putting the soda tax on the ballot. Um, I do think that. Uh, you know, I certainly think that it is in part our responsibility to uh, be mindful and, and looking out for the best interest of all in our community, of course. Uh, but I felt like that the process was uh, flawed and I did not feel like it was something that I could be supportive of um, at the time. I do think, and I said, you know, if we move forward, uh, we could potentially, we could consider putting one on a future ballot. but. Uh, and then the other flip side of it is that the state, you know, they're very, very well may be, and there have been multiple attempts at the state level to enact a statewide um, sugary beverage tax, and that may still actually uh, occur in this, uh, in this, either this, within this legislative session, so. Thank you. Brett? So I'm a supporter of the soda tax. Um, you know, on some things, when things come before the city council, we should not just sort of rubber stamp them and move them on to the ballot. I think on the soda tax, I would think that our voters would be able to make an informed decision as to what they think is best. If they think a soda tax is good, then let them decide. If they think it's bad, let them decide. I don't think that I need to debate amongst the council members and determine you know, what is best in terms of the community on the It's inherently relatively subjective. The reason I was willing to put it on the ballot is I think it's a twofer. Uh, if you remember what I answered before about us being short about six million dollars, soda tax brings in a couple million dollars a year. It makes finding the additional money for the roads and uh, bike paths a, a little bit easier. Uh, there was this idea like, oh, we're going to be encouraging people to drink soda so we get more tax money. And then the flip side is, oh, we're sort of the nanny state, we're taxing you so that you're not going to be able to buy soda. Y you know, when you go to a restaurant, you pay two dollars for a soda. The fact that it's going to cost two dollars and fifteen cents 
it's not a big deal, right? And anybody tells you it's a big deal is misrepresenting what was proposed. The only exception to that would be when you go to AMPM or 7-Eleven and buy like a gigantic 64 ounce <laughs> thing of soda for 99 cents. There the price is discernible. Everywhere else, not a big deal. Uh, so really for me on a subjective thing like this, I'm quite happy to let the people of Davis decide. And you know, I don't feel like we would have spent a lot of time detracting from other important city issues by placing it on the ballot. You, you know, I'm quite happy to let the community decide on something like this. So I, I'm disappointed that it wasn't placed on the ballot for this June. Okay, well. Uh, so like Brett, I was inclined to let the, the community uh, have the say in this. Um, this is one of those issues where um, there's real heat on both sides and very little uh, light. There was a lot of passion on both sides, and I found it very hard to get passionate about this issue. Was it going to end childhood obesity in Davis? No. Was it going to put our restaurants out of business? I don't think so. In fact, the arguments against it, um, I kind of called them Schrodinger's tax because it would both not be enough to, to make any discernible change, but it was so much that it was going to cripple our economy. Obviously, it's not both of those things. Uh, it is the type of tax it, it, that would be a free million or a couple million of dollars on everything, uh, on something that we entirely don't need in our lives. I didn't like the argument uh, that was made by uh, our good friend Bob Dunning where he compared the sugar in the soda to the sugar in a dessert. The difference is <laughs> most of us don't consume a big dessert with every meal, whereas So to me it didn't seem like a, a stretch to want to throw a dime at our city coffers every time I wanted to have a Coke. That didn't seem like a big deal to me, but uh, but there was a lot of passion on the issue, so um, I suppose in conclusion, I was happy to have the voters decide on that. It was one of those issues that um, still had some details to be worked out about how it would be implemented, how the money would be spent, et cetera. Um, so obviously uh, hesitant to come down in favor of that. I've learned my lesson, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I was, I was happy to have the voters decide. Thanks. And Paul? Before I begin, I'd like to say that one of the reasons I love to live in Davis, I love being here and why I settled here, is because just in something like this, you'll hear somebody mention Schrodinger's cat. Uh, that's wonderful, frankly. I haven't heard that term used publicly ever, and this man has my vote. <laughs> I'm just letting you know that that shows a level of intelligence, education is the kind of thing I want in a leader, and frankly, something I hope I can bring to you folks too. Now, the four questions on this one, very important. Am I involved? No, I don't even drink sugary sodas. I have a risk of diabetes. I'm not going to drink. I'm not involved. No conflict at all. Secondly, who's it going to hurt? Nobody. Nobody. Secondly, who's it going to help? Everybody. What's it going to cost? Nothing. It brings revenue in. Therefore, no brainer. Now, the idea that it shouldn't have gone into the ballot, forgive me, Lucas, I'm not trying to be combative, because there wasn't enough dialogue is ridiculous. Put it on the, di put it on the ballot. Oh, there'll be dialogue about this. <laughs> the sugary beverage industry will make sure there's a dialogue. It will be there. I'm all for putting these things on the ballot for the people to decide. More of that is good. Less of it is bad. Thank you. Any challenges on this one? Okay, um, Matt, you are asking Lucas the question. In the last into the mic, please. Into the microphone. Two inches. Okay. <laughs> In the last 120 days, city staff has presented to council a combined projection of greater than 655 million dollars in unfunded liabilities for the city over the next 20 years. Are you alarmed to find Davis has that level of unfunded liability? And given that we have a $50 million annual general fund budget, what are the important steps and decisions that council and staff need to make in order to address this $30 million a year funding shortfall? So this is a, this is a number that has been, you know, and actually it's not unique to, uh, 
to just the city of Davis. I mean, it, the, that specific figure may be unique to Davis, but uh, it's, a, it's an issue that every level of government is facing. Um, from cities such as Davis, but all the way up through the fe to the state and county, state and federal government, um, there is an absolute uh, need for us. And as was mentioned in my, my opening comments about um, certainly fiscal responsibility, and you know we have been uh, we need to do a much better job of ensuring that the city has adequate revenues to meet our obligations, both on the labor side of things, certainly but also in terms of the issues such as the, the roads, infrastructure, the bike paths. Um, I think that there is a real ability for us to, uh, and we've been starting this already, this process, but going in uh, and particularly during this coming budget cycle and in and future budget cycles, for us to have a real uh, frank dialogue, not just with um, each other, of course, but also with the community about how we actually go about prioritizing and, and funding some of these unmet needs. Um, we have, uh, we're at a situation right now where we have uh, not at all adequately funded uh, for these priorities. And I think you know, that we are going to have a few choices ahead of us. One certainly is this issue of, are we going to continue to go to the city citizens for parcel taxes, which is probably not an, uh, a real ultimate positive solution. But then there's also going to be uh, situations where we are looking for, certainly I think additional cuts are gonna need to be made in terms of uh, uh, some of the, and, but a, and some of the city programs that we offer. And we've done a lot of that already over the past several years. But I think we're going to continue. Uh, there's no real good answers, I mean, in terms of the, where we find that amount of money. Thanks. OK. Brett? So, so when you hear a figure like $600 million, it's rather daunting. But the way that's calculated, that's bringing everything forward in terms of you know, the current today unfunded liability. But that's amortized over time. And um, so I'm not trying to minimize it, but put it in perspective. It's like buying a home, right? You don't, when you buy a home and, uh, you know, let's just say you buy a $500,000 house. $500,000 is a lot of money, but it's broken out over 30 years. And so you pay a little bit at a time and eventually you get there. The city did something pretty important uh, on the council that Lucas and I were on. We actually imposed terms on a couple labor groups because we felt that their demands were not acceptable. And so we've been slowly turning the ship. And we have, over the past few years, been paying more and more and more into um, a fund, set-aside fund, for retiree pensions. So we anticipated that the CalPERS uh, uh, rate of return was uh, optimistic. And we had our own act independent actuary come in and tell us what percent contribution we should be making on behalf of each employee to make sure that we are able to catch up. And we are essentially current in terms of what we need to be paying to make sure that we head off sort of this day of reckoning where this huge lump sum is due. And so it's, it's a slight bending of the curve, but we're definitely headed in the right direction. I'm not here to say everything is rosy and wonderful. Absolutely not. We, uh, like Lucas mentioned, we're the same as pretty much every municipality in the state of California and um, actually the state itself. But we, we've turned the ship. And the independent actuary has had us setting aside a greater and greater proportions of our budget towards this. So I'm confident that if we stay the course, we will be OK. But having said that, uh, it is a challenge. And so we are not on easy street by any means. But it, it is a manageable situation because of some of the decisions we've made Thank recently. Thank you. So question one was, does that alarm you? I would suggest that uh, you would have to say that, that, yeah, that's a big number and it's alarming. Um, but uh, I think recent uh, councils are to be commended for the work that they've done uh, that Brett described uh, to move us toward um, staying above water with regard to these uh, uh, long-term uh, unfunded liabilities. Um, I think there's no, there certainly is, it's not just my opinion, there is no silver bullet that is going to, uh, to put us over the top here. 
uh, it's going to take an all hands on deck approach and that uh, includes revenue measures taxes that includes in my opinion uh, diversifying our revenue uh, portfolio uh, and of course that includes uh, the city uh, being uh, a fair but tough negotiator with our uh, with our employee groups um, you know the let's just take the parks tax for example it was passed by 90 percent or something in uh, in 2012 measure D and uh, it expires in a few years it it's 50 bucks 49 dollars a year but it only gets us a quarter of the way to to spending our uh, or, or to paying for our parks and I, I feel like folks have an expectation in town that there's going to be certain levels of service and amenities but we have to have a recognition that they're going to be paid for somehow and I'll leave with one um, anecdote that was shared with me which was um, uh, I'm hearing this third hand but a member of the tree commission said look we have so much trouble taking care of our existing stock of trees. They have the uh, mistletoe and other problems, uh, and yet we keep planting more trees. That's a metaphor for, for how we've done business for a long time, that create these new things when we're Thanks. trying to maintain what we have. Okay, Paul. Uh, Matt said he wanted to get some fire out of me. You're about to hear some probably. The only way to solve a problem is to understand how the problem happened in the first place. And what I've heard right now, and I hear from governments everywhere and different agencies, whether it's a fire district or a school district, is usually a reluctance to look deep enough into the process to find out what went wrong. Because if you don't know what went wrong, you can't fix it. You can't fix it through a parcel tax if the reason you're going for the parcel tax is perpetuating the problems that caused the shortfall in the first place. Be alarmed by this shortfall because what I heard what somebody say is we're going to have to cut services and programs. Why should we have to do that? We have to ask ourselves why. If you start cutting programs, pretty soon we'll decide what's essential or not. We'll be playing triage with the way of life in Davis that we're all here to protect. And that's why we're here. It could be parks next. Who knows? I don't know what the solution is. All I know is, is that I am trained to look at those problems, find out what went wrong, and solve them. That's my training for my entire professional career. I ask one question. Rich Rifkin wrote in the Enterprise that there's a firefighter who got over $100,000 in overtime. In overtime! Now, why wasn't an employee hired to do that job at less? You save money. Something's gone wrong. We need to find out what it is. We can correct it through positive taxes like a soda tax and by looking at how we're spending money and why. We don't necessarily have to cut anything. Okay, Matt. I admire Paul's optimism. I think we will have to cut things. 655 million, 200 million of that is for roads over 20 years. 352 million is for buildings and parks, and 114 million is for retiree pension and health and retiree health benefits. Um, Brad has said that we're doing better on pension and health benefit, retiree health benefits, and we are. But that's only 114 million of the 655. Um, Will has said we are we have a parks tax. And that parks tax, after we have spent it through its life, is leaving us with $315 million worth of capital infrastructure maintenance that we have to do to the parks, surfaces, and buildings. Um, these reports came from staff. They have come in the last 120 days. We really do need to understand what we have promised to ourselves. I'm not into finger pointing. We can't change the history. We need to move forward. Um, Rob, Rob Davis from the dais, oops, let me get this, talked about cost containment is an element of fiscal resilience. We need to undertake a full staffing analysis to determine a match between service delivery and this, the staffing. We may end up, if we do that, being able to do what Paul has said and preserve certain things. We commissioned John uh, Meyer to do a staffing analysis. 
He did it. He showed us where we were, were deficient, and we've done nothing about it since. We need to have the commitment to go, staying the course, and that is absolutely what we have to do. $30 million on a $50 million budget is not going to be a little bit at a time. Thank you. Okay, Lucas um, has a minute response. And, okay. Yeah. yeah, I would just say a couple things. Uh, you know, firstly, so to Matt's most recent point about the staffing analysis that was done by John Meyer pro bono for free for us, uh, you know, that is something that just was done a few months ago. Um, the reason we haven't acted upon it yet is because it was just completed, I mean, within the past few months. Um, we have been uh, very involved in making sure that our commissions, particularly most recently the Finance and Budget Commission, has been taking a top to bottom look at and opening the books to and we ha to everybody, but to, they have been certainly making sure that uh, we are on the right course uh, in helping providing uh, additional sort of guidance and uh, input to the city council as we move forward on some of these issues. Uh, you know, I think the I, I agree uh, about the issue. Uh, uh, with uh, regard to that Paul mentioned you know about you know why why do we have an you know firefighter getting hundred thousand dollars a year you know some of the numbers that you uh, in terms of overtime some of the numbers that are reported are, are a situation oh okay, oh. That, was a, okay. Yeah. Right, that was a minute okay, um, as well. uh, will is next and then I'll go to you thanks Brent uh, so um, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, for the record, I'm not sure if this question will come up, but um, that I am in favor uh, and was in favor, hoping it would happen this June, but it didn't, uh, for revenue measures specific to transportation infrastructure. We have our needs. The council is uh, to be commended for putting uh, some money aside uh, to address those needs, but it's, uh, it's not enough. And uh, I would, uh, would support uh, a revenue measure that is specific to transportation infrastructure. The two revenue measures that are on the ballot in June, both of which I support, uh, the marijuana tax might get us zero if, that does, if the, the thing doesn't pass in November. And then uh, the, um, the transit occupancy tax is not going to be, uh, it's going to be a drop in the bucket when it comes to paving our roads. So uh, that's something I support and I would support if I was elected. Okay, Brett. Yeah, so this, uh, four years ago I ran basically because I was just sort of a regular concerned uh, community member uh, being alarmed at uh, kind of the runaway expenses of the city government, both in terms of uh, reducing the retirement age for public and safety employees from age 55 to 50, which I, I don't view as sustainable for a small community like ours, and some of the previous councils giving uh, extremely large rage, wage, wage, uh, wage increases, raises, of like 36% to the firefighters. I respect the firefighters and they do an important job for our community, but that's not affordable and that's not sustainable. I can say that the current council, I think, has done a very good job in that respect. So if you look at the record of what we've currently done, we've moved away, we've changed direction of the council, and I think we are headed in a sustainable direction. And you've also heard about this idea that I keep mentioning about a four to five million dollar shortfall. That's to address some of the things that Matt is talking about. It's important, and unfortunately, in this extremely limited uh, two minutes to answer these large questions, can I take my extra minute since um, I have another challenge? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I hadn't so, thought of that, but yeah, sure. That was the challenge. So he's going to use another so minute. So here's the thing. So <laughs> we live in the state of California, which has retreated on its commit to, commitment to public infrastructure. They used to help pay for our roads. So this is not laid solely at uh, the door of the city of Davis sort of abdicating its responsibility. The city has been caught up by the state retreating and not funding the roads like they used to, not funding many of the programs they used to. So we're having to pick up a bigger and bigger share of these things. And so while I think the city council, um, especially in previous years, it has a lot of responsibility for where we are today, it's also the state. The state is doing this not only to municipal government, but also the school systems. And so I just want to point that out. It's not uh, only about mismanagement at the council level. Okay, we are now in the home stretch. Uh, we have two Vanguard questions and then we will wrap up uh, with a conclusion. So uh, we are back to uh, Lucas answering the question. Um, the first question is, 
How do you see us solving the student housing crisis in Davis? Do I have two hours to answer this question? <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll have a special segment on pass. it. Pass. No, uh, and th this is one, another one of these issues. This is probably the, one of the, maybe even the biggest issue facing Davis right now. I mean, uh, there's certainly the, the financial issues facing the city. There's no question. That is, that's uh, chief among the issues facing the city. But the issues fa regarding student housing and the, you know, sort of the appetite for growth that UC Davis has uh, is, uh, is, is issue number one for us. So we certainly need to engage the university in a much more pro uh, proactive way. That has not been happening. Um, I think that there it needs to, uh, and now there's been some other uh, issues recently that have come up in the media and in the news that uh, you know are, I think are probably taking the chancellor's time currently, uh, <laughs> spending spending away from uh, <clears throat> uh, away from dealing with her relationship with the city of Davis, but. I think that we do have a, actually a pretty good relationship with the university currently, and I think we could actually improve upon that quite a bit, but we really need to insist that, uh, and frankly, if it means this ultimately through legal means, uh, we need to insist that the city uh, uh, take a more proactive stance with the university, but particularly make sure that the university actually puts some of the housing, if they're going to continue to grow, put some of that housing on campus. Um, I have, it's, it's unbelievable that all of, I mean, we've seen this issue in the neighborhoods, especially abutting campus. They, you know, the, I, I'm, not, I'm not at all opposed to students. I think it's a, I mean, we, one of the reasons why this is a very good town to live in is because of the quality, uh, quality of life, because of, it's a college town, a university town. But I think that we need to actually have a, a major, major, not just one conversation, but ongoing and bolster the relationship with the university regarding their approach to growth. We cannot just have them putting all that growth upon the city of Davis. It's causing all of these associated issues, including the Sterling you know, apartment issue and others, uh, the vacancy rates at close to 0%, we, and it's impacting the quality of life in our community. We absolutely need to be engaged with the university. Thank you. Brett? So, so I would agree with what Lucas has said, especially with uh, working with the university. They are a sovereign entity, but I think we can work with them so that they uh, fulfill more of their uh, commitment to uh, apartments for students. I think also we build some additional apartments in the city. We have several proposals before us. Most of the problems I have with them are size and scale, so they can be scaled down. Uh, there haven't been any uh, large apartment complexes built in quite some time. I think also in terms of our downtown, we get kind of a twofer on this uh, by having some more mixed use downtown, so residential above uh, retail or commercial. I think that helps support our local shops. I mean, um, I'll just throw out there Alphabet Moon, right? There was a disappointment that uh, we lost that shop. If we have more people living downtown, they would tend to support those shops and hopefully independent shops. You know, I don't want Davis to become sort of a cookie cutter downtown in terms of just sort of national chains. and so. I think it's important that we find a way to support the shops downtown, and one of the ways is additional residential uh, uh, on second or third floors above the shops. I think that's probably, you know, that will help a bit, and then we also need to have sort of a, a realistic understanding that the students are moving into single-family residential neighborhoods. And we need to allow for that and minimize the negative impacts. Uh, the current council is working on a renter's ordinance and also working on the mini dorm ordinance. And the goal here is to minimize the negative aspects of groups of students renting single family residential. And um, it's gonna take a while for the university to catch up with the current shortfall of units. But I think we can do something so that the existing neighborhoods aren't as dramatically negatively impacted by what's going on currently. Sure. So, I would venture to guess that the most important decision that's ever been made by people uh, that affected the city of Davis was when uh, the UC Regents decided to put the university farm here. Uh, and, and for the most part, in fact, for the vast, vastly most part, it was a great thing for our community. Davis wouldn't be Davis without UCD. Our schools wouldn't be what they are without UCD. We, we wouldn't have the cultural and educational uh, opportunities uh, that we have uh, of a town our size without UCD. But like any college town, 
and I don't think it's unique to Davis, these relationships get strained. I think they probably deal with this in Ann Arbor. They probably deal with this in Chapel Hill. They certainly dealt with it in Eugene, Oregon, where I went to school. Um, but when it's said that UCD isn't fulfilling its obligations uh, for housing, that's not just somebody's opinion. These are agreements that UC Davis made. They agreed uh, with, in an MOU with the city that they would house 25% of their students on campus. They're close to that. They're in the low 20s, but they're not where they agreed to be. And in, in their, uh, I believe it was called housing or, or something for the 21st century, uh, for the whole University of California system, they wanted 38% of their housing to be on campus. And of course, they're not even in that ballpark. So it's not just that we're pulling out a concept or some numbers out of thin air when we say the university isn't doing its part to house uh, students. It's their own obligations that they've made that they're not fulfilling. Okay, first of all, uh, this is enormously complex as we know, and I don't know a lot about it. Part of the reason I'm running for city council is because, as I said in the beginning, I'm an information nut. I love information, and I happen to know, because of my work getting information from public agencies, that when you are a part of a governing council or board, you have access to information the public does not. And I want to be able to get the information to look at this problem. But I approach this as I would any problem within my profession. This is a negotiating problem is what it is. And the first question that comes to my mind as a, a trained and experienced negotiator is, why does the university not build more housing? Why are they going out against and going against an interest or an agreement that we have? That doesn't make a lot of sense at first. But what comes to mind immediately to me is because they believe that they don't have to. They know we will. And if no one has to do something, they won't. So I would want to look at this problem and ask myself, what could we do to be able to persuade them that they really ought to build these houses? Once we understand what that is, then that problem will be solved generally in the short term. But right now it hasn't happened. And my big question is, why? The only way to find out is to sit there and find out with the city staff giving you the information that can only be given to and received by a city council member. I concur with Paul. What we don't know can hurt us. And the one place where I might differ slightly is that if we try and negotiate them with Alleyoop's club beating them over the head, the chances are we're not going to get anywhere. We somehow have to be able to find and define the win-win uh, playing field. Right now, they don't see, I agree with Paul, they don't see any win at all in building housing on the campus. Uh, what we need to do is to somehow reach out to them. I met uh, on Wednesday with Ramona Hernandez, the head of, uh, of student housing, um, and suggested that it would be really, really good for them to be able to see where's the zip code origin of all 36,000 of their students, and be able to know that X percent of them are now coming from West Sac in Sacramento and getting off at Richards and trying to go through the tunnel and parking in the B Street uh, neighborhood for free and walking into the campus. The impacts on the quality of life of Davis, UCD only sees it anecdotally. We need to build an information base. They actually have incredible amounts of information. They know where every student is by zip code. So they'll be able to see what the evolution is of the 5,600 additional students they've added in the, four, in the past four years. They can look at the distribution of where they live from four years ago and where it is now and understand what the impact is on the, the city. Once you understand the, what you're doing to your partner, and this clearly is, as Will said, when they located UCD here, they formed a partnership. We need to be able to engage the university in a more productive way in order to forge a more positive partnership. Can I take my uh, 30 second? Uh, no? 
so I just want to add that it's important that we recognize that the students are not the problem, right? I mean, you go away to college, you want to live in your college town. I had the good fortune of being able to walk from where I live to campus, and uh, you know, it's nice for students and faculty to be able to have that. So the, the students are, you know, the goal here is to have a nice, safe, secure, convenient location for students that they can walk or bike to school and really enjoy that campus life. So, you know, let's not, in sort of our concern about mini dorms and apartment complex proposals, really kind of throw the students under the bus. As Lucas and everyone have said, you know, we need to work with the campus. And I, okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll use my 30 seconds. Go ahead. Houses are converted into mini dorms because the owner of the house sees an economic benefit to, to making that conversion. He gets six, Julia has two single family homes on either side where there were families for years. Now she has weeds sprouting up in the, in the front yards, left and right, and seven students to the left and six students to the right. The landlords, the owners of those houses, are making money from those rentals. Thank you. Okay. Any others? Okay. Uh, so here is the. Oh, sorry, Paul. Um, you have one minute. A one minute left. Okay. Uh, there's just one more question. Okay. <laughs> okay. The last question, and Brett's going to go first on this one. Uh, do you support or oppose extending the joint management of the Davis and UC Davis fire departments? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, I would be, uh, I'd be happy to debate anybody on the merits of a town our size having two fire chiefs. That just on the surface of it doesn't make sense. The joint management was done to improve efficiency and improve response times, and I think the data has shown that that is true. Having said that, the university is a separate organization, and the City of Davis Fire Department is also a separate organization, and they're sort of joined at the top in terms of a shared management system. We definitely need to work out some kinks. Um, if any of you have you know, worked in a, for a company where there's been a merger, and this isn't a true merger at the employee level, but at the management level, you know, there are differences and there are cultural differences and there are things like that, or corporate culture issues that need to be worked out. And right now the morale could be improved. And I think some basic simple steps can be done to improve the morale of both entities. But absolutely I support the shared management of our fire service in town. A, a town, wow, I've got a minute left. Uh, but to me this is a straightforward one. We're a small town. The university is contiguous to the city, right next door. It seems silly that we would think that we need two fire chiefs and two separate fire services for uh, a locality this small. Uh, yeah, I'm with, uh, with Brett on this one that uh, I think there's no reason that we, w we should ever take steps back and decouple these two. That d It just doesn't make sense from a public safety perspective, uh, if, if, if only that, and that's the most important thing here. Um, there are, uh, you describe them as kinks to be worked out or, or corporate culture or whatever, and for those reasons, I am uh, open to, but maybe even beyond that, uh, would, would like to see a full merger um, be discussed, be analyzed, and, and see how we can get there. I'd frankly like to see the fire chief be right down the street here in downtown Davis, so so uh, any citizen or city council member who wants to go see the fire chief doesn't have to spend nine bucks for parking and be on be outside of town. Uh, but uh, but no, uh, I I, I want to work toward a full merger. I understand the challenges that uh, that that presents to us, uh, but uh, but the alternative to that, in my opinion, is is not going to be decoupling the two. That just doesn't make sense from a public safety perspective. I agree with Brett and Will. <laughs> <laughs> One of the great things about the Vanguard is, is it shares information that isn't otherwise shared. For a number of months, maybe six months, 
after the, the uh, joint management was agreed to, uh, the chief, uh, Nathan Trowernick, shared with us statistics that showed that it, we were more efficient, more effective, they spent less money, there was less overtime, there were fewer situations where uh, there was an uncovered uh, station where one, one, like the East Davis fire truck had gone to cover downtown, they didn't need to do that anymore. Safety was improved. I agree with Brett and Will and Paul. I'm very persuasive. <laughs> uh, I'm in agreement with everyone as well. So, um, so I voted for the boundary drop a few years ago when it came before the council to, you know, there had previously been an artificial boundary between the two. You know, what, you know, right there at A Street is an example, and on Russell, um, it's silly. There, we're contiguous. We work together. We need to be ha continuing to have collaborative uh, work with the university, and it's just another way to uh, to ensure that's happening. Um, I did vote against the shared management structure, though. Um, I was worried about having, you know, uh, having the chief be a UC Davis employee. Actually, that still worries me. <laughs> I mean, their core competency is they teach people, They're, they teach students, you know, and they, uh, it's a university. They don't run fire departments. Um, I mean, most of the universities in this state do not have their own fire department. That is a role of the municipal government. Uh, I believe firmly in that. Uh, I think that uh, even UC Santa Cruz, which was the only other UC that had its own fire department, um, they merged their on-campus UC Santa Cruz Fire Department with the city of Santa Cruz Fire Department a few years ago. They went sort of the opposite direction. So I think we need to have, uh, there have been kinks in this process uh, as any sort of uh, new endeavor is going to uh, entail. I think that uh, we are gonna, we continue to have discussions this spring at the council level about the city budgeting, uh, city budget and sort of our priorities. And then a couple of other areas quickly, um, you know, one, some of these kinks, the weekly management team meetings that the city manager has with all the department heads, including the police chief and others, the, the fire chief doesn't attend those meetings because <laughs> he's on campus usually. And so, uh, you know, that's one ex area where, you know, who is, who's really in charge, right? The city manager is in charge of all the different department heads, but yet not necessarily in charge of the fire chief. So, and where that, that role falls to the university. So, um, and then also that other customer service issue Will sort of alluded to is that if you're an average Davis citizen, you want to go to, ha you need a customer service issue. You used to be able to go right here to the downtown fire station or any one of the city fire stations. Now you're required to go on campus to that fire station as the first place to go. So, I'm, but I do support the, the shared management as it's, it just, we need some adjustments to it. Yeah, I have a rebuttal to that. Um, a joint management is a great idea, and there's a lot of reasons why. I've represented a number of, of fire districts as general counsel. As a matter of fact, if you look on the internet, you'll find that I filed an amicus brief on behalf of the Elk Grove Community Services District a number of years ago. Um, it's a good idea to be able to unify, not just for purposes of when it comes to saving money, but also it's important because it prevents a fire district like ours from taking over management, essentially, co-opting it completely. And if you've read the, the Vanguard, you know that happened at one point here in Davis, where there was a report that was put out, critical of the fire department, that the Davis City Council actually voted to suppress from themselves and the public. And the Vanguard had to sue, as well as the Woodland Record, to get a copy of it. And they successfully did, and it showed too cozy a relationship. If you have one manager, one management structure, believe it or not, spread out over the area that we've got, it will avoid that happening. And that's very important when it comes to bargaining with our employees and making fair business decisions and employment decisions. It's a great idea. We should do it. So point of information, this is the last chance to, to, to have my rebuttal, and I can't carry it over to the next uh, forum, can I? Okay, I'm not, so I'll do, my, I'll do my 30 seconds. This is not specific to shared management, but it is about fire. Uh, there are two other infrastructure issues that I believe are important. Number one, this, uh, this downtown station, according to uh, Chief uh, Trowernick uh, and others, is in desperate need of, of rehabilitation. And I happen to live uh, in North Davis, north of Covell Boulevard, where the response times are outside of, of where our city needs them to be. And so I would be, um, clearly it's 
going to cost money, so we have to figure out how we're going to pay for it. But I would be in favor of addressing that potentially with a station uh, in North Davis like on Cobell. Whenever we're making decisions about the quality of life in the community, and, and Will has brought up that response times in the far north Davis don't meet our standards, ultimately it does boil down to money. So the question brings me full circle to the fire station downtown is part of that $655 million, but a new fire station is not. What's the difference between nice to haves and need to have? And part of our job in understanding what we need to spend money on going forward is to be able to separate out the need to haves from the nice to haves. Um, I see that the, the $24 million, or I heard it's up to $31 million sports park as a nice to have. I think we need to focus on the need to have. Okay, so um, the last part of this, um, each uh, candidate will get two minutes, starting with Will, to um, offer their kind of closing remarks, and then we'll be done. Good. Uh, so I want to thank uh, David and the, and, and the Vanguard. I see a lot of uh, past and present members of their editorial board here. I also uh, want to thank, of course, uh, Bob and Civ Energy and uh, DMA again for your work. Uh, so we talked about a lot of issues here. Um, probably, uh, I don't know, a dozen issues maybe. When you're elected to the city council, you're probably going to make a thousand decisions a year, maybe more. And, and some of those decisions that anyone who gets elected in June, we're not going to know, it, we're not going to see it coming. And so um, I think that's what I want to leave you with is, is the idea of, 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 of what's being elected or who's being elected. Um, I love this town in a pretty ridiculous way. Uh, I, have a, I have a tattoo on my ankle of the town logo that I got about 10 years ago in a particular moment of swelling of town pride. Uh, I was born here. I have a plot at the cemetery. I'm in this for the long haul. We have three kids, two are under two years old, and they're going to be graduating from Davis High in 2032 and 2034, respectively, uh, which sounds like science fiction, but it's coming, and that's my minimum time horizon uh, for the, the decisions that we'll be facing, is how is it going to affect our community decades from now. So thank you for this opportunity, and, and hopefully uh, along the way I can earn your support. My wife tells me that I've made some terrible mistakes. <laughs> One of them is, is that I'm not going to be soliciting for funds, any contributions, and I'm not going to be asking for endorsements. And the reason why I'm doing that is not because I'm trying to commit political suicide, but because I really believe in my heart that the major problem with politics in America everywhere, including here, is that people are elected and they owe people things. They just do. They owe the people who give them contributions, whether it's the firefighters, the developers, it doesn't make a lot of difference. And when the time comes to make decisions, even though they say that they're being unbiased and they probably are not being biased, there's still that little bit of quid pro quo. And I want to come into this completely clean because the decisions that Davis has to make have to be free of special interests. We have to make it for what's best for our people within our town to maintain our standard of living and it's not going to be easy. I look at the problems that are happening in Davis right now and I just get the feeling that we haven't been looking toward the long picture, the big picture, and we're making decisions to try to solve problems from the past without remedying the problems themselves. I want to be able to be in a position where I can help solve those problems, to be able to look at the information, to gather it, to be able to analyze it, and to provide something so that my kids 
can have as good a life as I've had here. And I see there's a chance they may not be true when I hear that programs need to be cut. We've talked about a lot of issues today. And as important as those issues are, I believe nothing is more important than the abundant and pervasive level of distrust that exists within our community. Or said another way, the general lack of trust that colors so many of our community decisions. My term on the council, if elected, will be 100% committed to earning and increasing your trust. Davis is more than people politics. It is more than decisions about pieces of residential real estate. It is more than decisions about pieces of commercial real estate. Davis is a precious, special, fragile place. We don't need evidence any further than driving down the streets to see the cracks in the road. That's a cra those are cracks in our special place. We've seen the breakdowns in public safety. We've seen ever-increasing levels of taxes. Some people are very concerned about the threat of sprawl development, and we certainly have massive parking problems downtown. We need to engage these problems. I will be totally committed to full-time engagement on that. Um, I look forward to being a public servant. I look forward to earning your vote. Uh, thanks again for David and Vanguard and uh, DMA and Civ Energy for hosting today. And thanks everyone for being here. It's pretty amazing to see about 100 people here in the audience uh, on a fairly rainy s Saturday afternoon. Um, so serving on the city council is a big job. Uh, it's, and it's frankly one that I take quite seriously though. Uh, working for the citizens of Davis is extremely rewarding, um, I, which is why I ask you uh, respectfully for your support to allow me to continue working on behalf of our community. Um, we have been, thankfully, been able to restore some of the lost city programs and positions, and while we also help prepare our city for the next rainy day, uh, so that we'll be prepared for when and not if Davis faces similar circumstances in the future. Um, I've been proud of the work we've been doing over the past four years, the surface water projects, some of the other infrastructure projects, like our wastewater treatment plant. Those things may not be that sexy to folks, but it's helping to set up the community for generations to come. Um, some of my priorities for Davis in the coming few years are additional critical investments in infrastructure, including roads, bike baths, broadband, parks, and city facilities. I wanna continue our sustainability efforts, including starting a community choice energy program, which I think has a potential for greener and cheaper energy here locally. Um, reforming the late night downtown party scene uh, while enhancing our already vibrant downtown through additional arts and cultural opportunities. And I also wanna increase opportunities for affordable housing around town. Uh, additionally, my leadership uh, on regional bodies, including YOLO Bus, the Capital Corridor, the Sacramento Area Council of Governments, and the YOLO Habitat Conservancy, uh, have uh, well prepared me to, to serve again on our city council. I'd be honored to have your support for re-election to the Davis City Council. So I'll uh, echo the, the thank you for attending this on a Saturday afternoon, and thank you, David, and uh, DMA, and Civ Energy for uh, hosting this. I don't have too much to say, but I guess in two minutes, it, two minutes goes very quickly. I would just say that, um, as Will says, you don't really know what are going to be the big issues. So when I ran for uh, council election a few years ago, who knew that the downtown bar scene was going to be one of the big issues? And this is an important issue. It's important that we get it right, that it's well thought out, that we don't uh, inadvertently, uh, you know, create hardship for some of the businesses that we want to keep and have them prosper downtown. It's important that we get it right so that it's safe. Safe for people to go down and have, uh, you know, for college students to go and have an enjoyable evening and also citizens to go and have something to eat. So these are the types of things that come up. And I think my track record has shown, has shown that I'm uh, independent. So the, the, the issue about special interest, uh, unduly influencing decisions. I think my track record has shown that I am not unduly influenced by special interest. I think my track record has shown that I'm fairly reasonable and uh, responsible and fairly thoughtful. I do my homework on the issues and I'm willing to reach out and I'm also open to uh, input from the community. I think those are important things. And I think something also very important um, that has been shown in my track record is that I'm willing to work with my colleagues. 
So in the past, we've had some pretty, pretty contentious city councils. And um, that can be okay, but I can tell you just uh, as a little aside. So we talked about the soda tax. So Lucas and I came down on different sides on that. I was a supporter of it. Lucas said wasn't a supporter. Within uh, the next week, Lucas and I are meeting on a Monday evening at 6 o'clock, spending three hours together, interviewing potential commission members to the various city commissions. And so as you look, sometimes there are these big issues and you kind of want somebody out, uh, you know, slugging it out. But the ability to work well with others is also important for all these medium-sized issues. Okay, that is it, right? You went. Well, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Just making sure. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming out. And I, I want to, again, thank uh, Davis Media Access for uh, videoing this. Um, and Jeff Shaw spending time. Uh, and, and thank you to all the candidates and uh, members of the public. Have a good evening. And, your daughter, and thank yeah. my daughter. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>